pod sass by putting the sass back in sassy sponsored by leader pro where you can book demos with target customers on demand and fill your sales pipeline instantly hey everybody welcome to another episode of pod sass i'm your host chris shang and today we have marin uh, from Omni Search, how are you doing? Hey, hey, Chris, I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, of course. Thanks for joining us. Um, where, are you, where are you coming to us from? So I'm in Croatia. Okay. I'm originally Croatian. Spent a, a, a lot of my professional career in the U.S. and Canada, but now back now back home, building our office over here. That's awesome. Congratulations on that. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit, real quick, about Omni Search? You know, and also who makes a good customer for you guys. Yeah, totally. So OmniSearch, we, we like to think of it as the search for everything. And that essentially means just to, you know, put it into a little bit more detail that we're able to search any type of content just as easily as you would search text. So be that audio or video content, images, presentations, whatever, even text itself, we're able to extract all the relevant information from, the, from that content automatically, completely out of the box with no extra effort from the customer, and then make all of that searchable through a you know textual interface. And so essentially we, mostly customers use us in you know what you would think of as site search use cases, meaning that they integrate us into their own sites. And so just to give you a quick illustration, a lot of the companies that we work with are companies in the online education space. Mm -hmm. and so as you can imagine, they've got you know, lots of different content types, be that, you know, video lessons, presentations, slides, handouts, text lessons, um, anything of that sort. And so once they integrate us, we process all of those materials, as we said, completely out of the box, and then make all those materials searchable to, to their own end users. So that means they can find literally the spot inside videos where something is mentioned or covered or the exact spot in the uh, in the textual lessons in the documents and presentations and basically any type of content that, that you can imagine got it very cool um awesome so uh i have a lot of questions about that but we'll before i'm going to hold off on that for now and then let's talk about you know you and your journey to starting omni search um We'd like to do that in a series of just kind of like rapid fire questions. Uh, nothing too crazy, but we just get to know you a little bit better. So if you're up for it, we can jump into that first. Absolutely. Awesome. Let's do it. So the first question is pretty straightforward. It's a favorite entrepreneur and or startup story. It could be one of the same or different. Okay. Well, the, the guy that I always admired the most and it's actually none of the none of the guys that you would that you would think of that are more popular in recent times. My my favorite guy is Bob Noyce, mm. and that is the of course the the legendary co-founder of Intel. And I think that, that that I like him for a bunch of different reasons. One of the one of the main reasons is that he was so good at both engineering and business. Because if you think about it, you know he was a Nobel Prize caliber physicist. He co-invented the integrated circuit. And if he, you know, hadn't, I don't know, smoked like a chimney and died of a heart attack, he, he would have actually gotten it. And in addition to this, he was also a co-founder, first of Fairchild Semiconductor and then of Intel. And really kind of a key figure in these first couple of decades when Silicon Valley was sort of just congealing into the thing that we know today. That's mm -hmm. why I love him so much. Interesting. So like a pioneer in, in, that, in that sense. Yep. Um, and would you say that's also your favorite startup story or do you have another one? In, in terms of startup stories, I got to say, and th this one is probably like a little, a little bit corny, but I, I got to say that I always liked the, the Airbnb thing where they made mm. the, the, the Captain Crunch cereals, <laughs> um, when, when they were out of money, but were so, so, you know, desperate to get their idea off the ground. So that this, I really liked it showed their nimbleness and their ability to do whatever it takes to, to make their dream come true. Yep. Absolutely. I love that story too. Um, and I don't think a lot of people are necessarily aware of that all the time where it's like, you know, they, they've been around before they became really popular, more of a household name. There's like five to I think six, seven years, somewhere like that before um, where they were just trying to trying to make it work. Um, and I think like it wasn't until they had the idea of like taking photos, but having control over the photos of these places. And they would literally go into these individual apartments and take the photos themselves 
uh, to kind of like institute the template, if you will, of like how it's kind of done today. So I think, I think actually, yeah, that was the turning point as I remember yeah. it. Yeah. Interesting. Um, next question is, do you remember what you wanted to be as a kid uh, talking about eight, nine, 10 years old? <laughs> the, the, the real answer to that, the, there are two answers to that question. The first one is an answer to a security question. So I'll leave that one for myself. <laughs> but uh, but the, the second one was was doctor. And yeah. that was that was, I think, even even before probably when I was like five years old. And okay. Basically, my late grandfather was was also a great doctor. He, you know, rose from very humble beginnings to become a surgeon and a professor of medicine, and so he was he was an inspiration. Mm. But that that left that left me. But fortunately, as they say, you know, one doctor in the family every two generations is the rule of thumb. My, my yeah. sister my sister fulfilled that dream. Awesome, very cool. Um, next question is uh, most painful experience, and I'll give it some context, which is. Um, I think our most exponential growth, whether it's personal or professional, typically stems from a place of extreme discomfort. So my question to you is, uh, again, personally or professionally, has there been any time you've gone through a very trying or difficult situation where obviously it was um, challenging during that time, but ultimately ended up being like a character defining moment for you now? Well, I have to say that you know, both both my decision to leave Amazon, where mm -hmm. where it was, you know, going at that point really well for me, um, th th that was a pretty character defi de defining experience. Although I wouldn't say it was it was particularly unpleasant. I mean, this was the, the, the irony was that I had just gotten a promotion and I left after probably like my first paycheck at the higher at the higher salary. But at that point, it was just time to time to move on and time to do something on my own. And luckily, luckily, my boss at the time, greatest boss in the world, understood this and was fully supportive. But then, you know, tying into that into that first startup. So my, my first startup was a machine learning powered news recommendation engine. And that, unfortunately, you know, though I started out with great expectations, that didn't really go particularly well. So that had to get shuttered, uh, which meant that I had at that point spent year and a year and four months probably working on that thing full time and burning through a whole lot of my savings. So that that was not that that was not very enjoyable. Got it. Fair enough. Uh, but that is, you know. I love hearing those stories because that's the very real part of a startup, right? Which is like this balancing act of somehow getting through and living <laughs> at the same time building something, right? And not everybody's fortunate enough necessarily to to raise, you know, venture funding right out the gate. And a lot of times, you know, it's you do go through a number of iterations of like second, third, fourth startups before you actually do raise anything because Obviously, VCs are looking for founders that have had experience um, or have the wherewithal to know what to expect and minimize their risk of investment, right? So, um, but yeah, I, I don't, I, I feel you on that. And there's a lot of founders we've had on here where, you know, they've talked about their, their different types of like experiences with, with trying to do that balancing act. Um, that said, obviously, you know, we're alluding to the fact that it's, it's difficult to start a startup, uh, a lot of challenges, a lot of hats you have to wear. Um, and obviously, and a lot of times our backs are pushed against the wall. So, what is, what is the thing that motivates you in that twenty fifth hour? And, and you know, even for example, like having to shut down that first startup and then being still inspired or motivated to do the second one. Like, what's pushing you constantly to kind of like get over these hurdles and humps? I mean, I, I suppose that I've always dreamed of you know making some sort of an impact in the tech industry as 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 generally as I as I could. And starting a startup seemed to me like the best, like the best way to do that. And that's what really motivated me. Also, you know, my, my dad had a software company for, mm. for a number of years. So watching him work also taught me a lot about it. So even, even, you know, some of the challenges that I could then, okay, relate to once they hit me. But I think that, that it's been mostly, I would say, yeah, mostly it's the impact part. I've always really wanted to have an impact in, in the industry. And I always felt like I could achieve it better with a startup of my own rather than, you know, going to work into in big tech or staying working at big tech. Mm. Uh, and granted, like th this deserves a, uh, this deserves a little asterisk 
you know, um, certain decades are dominated by startups. Certain other decades are dominated by by bigger players. Like if you're actually talking about the decade of 2010 to 2020, I would definitely argue that this was a decade when big tech had more of an impact because, you know, the big advances that you had in cloud computing, that, that you had in AI, all of these were, you know, things that happened in bigger institutions. But, you know, for, for that, you probably needed to be a bit further up to have a bit more impact on, on what was actually being done. So, you know, Interesting. In, in my case, I felt that going, going to do a startup was the better bet. Got it. Fair enough. Um, obviously, we've, we've already mentioned that it can be stressful. Is there anything that you do to personally decompress? Very, very few things nowadays. Um, back, back in the back some years ago, I uh, so I used to swim when I was when I was a kid, like I was mm -hmm. I, I actually took lessons th three times a week was even like pseudo competitive. Um, and so especially when I was in Vancouver for about three years in that in that place, I would go swimming like three, three times a week for an mm -hmm. hour. And that helped me decompress. Um, unfortunately that got shut down during COVID. Yeah. <laughs> and so now, now I try to, you know, do hiking, maybe like a little bit of tennis, but mostly just relax with my friends and my family members, um, just over beer or over, you know, some sort of dinner or quick coffee. Got it. Um, I already mentioned this briefly just a little bit ago, but you know, you wear a lot of different hats as a founder, right? Has there been a skill set that you've picked up along the way that, You've had a strong emotional disposition towards either loved or hated that you didn't think you would ever pick up. Well, I mean, you got when, when especially like when you're C CEO of a really small startup, like you need to you need to learn to sell and do marketing, hmm. and that for a technical founder is not really like in your ballpark. You'll you'll go to like in my case, probably to about twenty seven uh, without really doing it at all. And so that, that was a fairly difficult one to pick up, but, uh, you know, eventually you have to, you know, as you yeah. said, back against the wall, you got to make it or break it. So. Awesome. I love it. Um, the next question is more personal, but uh, number one, do you have a bucket list? And then number two is what's one of the more ambitious items on that bucket list? If you don't mind sharing. List isn't like a glorified to-do list. Yeah. Like, you know, Bucket list and the idea of like, in my lifetime, I want to do X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I want, I want to take, take OmniSearch as, as far as it can go. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, how far that's going to be. We can't, really, we can't really predict the future, but I really think that at this point, we've got such an amazing team assembled that I'm, I'm feeling very optimistic about it. Like I said, you know, we want to make an impact in the industry. Yep. Fair enough. Uh, last question is the idea of legacy, um, but more importantly, what kind of impact do you want to leave on this earth before you leave it? So I would say that, that you know, apart from the business, I would definitely at some point under the assumption that I do manage to accumulate some sort of wealth, um, I would like to contribute to philanthropy in, in some way, you know, maybe medical research or, or something along these lines, um, cancer treatment, uh, maybe some of the some of the new um, you know genetic methods of uh, like CRISPR and whatnot. Um, fund some research in that area. Got it. Got it. Cool. Um, well, that's it for the series of rapid fire questions. But a lot of great nuggets in there um, that I'd like to dive into a little bit more right now. Um, more importantly, I think yeah, just talking about um, you know making that decision from leaving Amazon, just getting a promotion leaving shortly after that promotion, like, you know, you're saying like two, two, three weeks or something like right afterwards um, and pursuing that first startup. Walk me through what you were thinking and what that, com what conviction you had that kind of pushed you to do and pursue that first startup. Was it something that you had already been working on on the side and kind of got a little bit of traction or momentum or, you know, some validation and, and pushed you over the edge or, Okay. No, not really. No, it, it was just an idea at that point because, well, I suppose that that regardless, I would have to say that you know because of all the, the, the all the papers that you sign. But no, I actually didn't have anything anything done at that point. 
Mm -hmm. Um, It was just an idea. And the idea isn't like it's it wasn't as outlandish as you as you might think like even thinking that that could succeed because I was actually studying the the Chinese sec- tech sector a lot. And you know, actually that you might know actually that the, the company by dance that is behind mm-hmm. TikTok actually started off with a, with, with something along these lines. Yep. Um, and so, well, yeah, you know, by dance is a big company and this thing is really huge. Why don't I try to pull that off? Mm. Uh, unfortunately, it was a couple of years too late, and uh, you know, news consumption is, I, I think, significantly different in the West than it is than it was there, because you know, a lot of people will just find things through Facebook or Twitter, or just go straight to the news portals. Sure. Not to mention that you had like thirty other apps in the App Store. Yeah. Now, what would you say? Like that first, you know, you said you mentioned like a year, right? Like, what were were you a solo founder at that time, kind of like doing all the coding on your own and, and trying to take it to market or did you have a, okay. So I, I, I started this off as a, as a solo founder. I afterwards had a really, really amazing mobile developer join me part-time, but yeah, I was the only one working on it full-time. It. So yes, I was, I was wearing all the hats. Fair enough. Um, is there anything that you would say in particular that you learned for the second go around? Um, as like either something that, you know, you should have done or that you shouldn't do? The stick to B2B, I would say, you know, B2C is is a way riskier thing. Like I would even say like, I don't know, when, when you're talking about B2C, try launching a bunch of different things, you know, the, the, what did they say on Twitter, you know, treated like cattle, not pets <laughs> um, and, and, and see what, what picks up traction. Got it. Um, but I think that the, the better bet was to go B2B because that, that allows you to react more to, to feedback from the market and to actually converge into something that, that the market really needs. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. Um, but, uh, but, but I also think that I, that it helped me a lot because I did try to fundraise with that one. So I could anticipate a whole lot of the, the VC questions later on for, for the second time around when we were more successful at it. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, for sure. Um, with that first startup too, I mean, you mentioned like going through, uh, you know, burning through your savings for that first year, et cetera. Um, can you walk us through like, you know, where were some promises maybe that you made to yourself when you made that leap from Amazon off into your own? And, and was there any like, I mean, I've heard like a lot of different stories. There's been, you know, founders that said, we're going to give ourselves a year and, you know, um, there's been other founders where like, you know, somebody who's like an angel investor gave them a garage to work out of and, and they were working out of that for like a year and a half and they had to choose ultimately between charging their laptops or getting heat during the winter. And this is like in in the Nordic winters where it's like my, <laughs> minus whatever, 15, 20 degrees Celsius. Um, but has there been, yeah, what were kind of like those more, I guess, like personally challenging moments about entrepreneurship or something that you didn't anticipate um, outside of the business realm of it, right? Like, because I think that's that's important, I think for founders to also, for founders to talk about, but also like, uh, I think be aware of, um, you know, what are some of those, uh, the, the risks that they're taking and then some of the challenges they can anticipate um, outside of the business side. The, the, the part that, that made it somewhat easier for me is that, like it, it, this works if you're a developer, I don't, I don't think it works nearly as well for non-technical founders, mm. but if you're a developer, you can always apply to freelance platforms. And in particular, like I, I was on top Tal, which is one of the, one of the more, more famous ones. And I passed the interviews there and I, I, I was listed there with varying availability, but so that meant that I could always take on projects to replenish the, the lost savings that I had burned through. So I always encourage people to, you know, to, to be open to these kinds of options because that'll allow you to, you know, work on your own ideas. And then, you know, you can, you can charge pretty decent money as a, as a freelance software engineer, and that'll help you replenish all the stuff that, uh, that you burn through. And I think that's, that's definitely a preferable thing than a, hard failure where you just burn through everything. And now you're like, Oh, I'm broke. I got to go back to a job that I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That was your captain crunch. 
<laughs> yeah, totally. To right, because the Airbnb or, guys or Upwork or whatnot. Yeah, it's a it's a good Captain Crunch. Yeah. Yeah, I mean those Airbnb guys are not necessarily they. Uh, at least the, the CEO wasn't a technical founder, so they had to kind of get do with what they. They got to so. they got to be a, they got to be a bit more creative. But as a software yeah. engineer, you've got a you've got a playbook. That's that's a good that's a very good point. I'm a, I'm not a technical founder myself, and so I, I, I mean I feel that, but um, that makes a ton of sense. So for anybody who's like an engineer that. They have no excuse then basically is what you're telling them is they have no excuse for not taking a chance on themselves and and betting on themselves they have opportunities to to continue to make somewhat of a living to substantiate themselves during that process yeah, yeah totally for sure um so let's let's talk about you know like you mentioned uh taking on the sales and marketing skill set as a as a technical founder right like i'm on the opposite end and so that's my strength um but how you know what would you suggest because we have a lot of you know, engineers and technical founders on on our audience. And um, I'd love to kind of understand how were you thinking about, and then ultimately, how did you tackle the challenge of learning this new skill set, which for me, you know, for me, like on the flip side would be foreign to learn, you know, programming languages, but obviously I've had to get familiar, at least on a, on a surface level of like how to understand it a little bit. So. So I think that, you know, as a technical founder doing these these business things, the, the business side of, of running the company, you you just got to learn by trial and error. Mm. Like you, you got to, I think, not be afraid to actually talk to customers and you shouldn't procrastinate on that. We were, I think, for, for a technical team, fairly good in, in terms of bringing the product to market helps to be a fast coder. Um, and then, you know, actually getting some paying customers, but you got to not be afraid to, you know, pick up the phone, not pick up the phone. That's not customarily done nowadays, but, you know, write those emails, do the cold LinkedIn outreaches and and whatnot, and just, you know, get people on the phone or on a Google meet and, uh, you know, see, see what questions they're going to ask you. And even if it bombs, you will have learned something that you can apply in, in the other, in, in future calls. And so just rinse and repeat. Yeah. But I would say that like the, the main things are don't procrastinate on that. Don't, you know, build the, the, some sort of Rube Goldberg uh, device without trying to sell it to the market and getting some feedback. So don't yeah. procrastinate on that. And also then don't be afraid of, you know, getting a couple of hard knocks. Yeah. I mean, okay. So, uh, I, I advise for several VC firms and early stage companies, right, um, on go to market and 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 uh, sales processes in the very beginning before it's all founder led sales teams and before they get to their executive hires. And so this is a big hurdle for me to overcome with sometimes the some of these technical founders, um, and and it's definitely psychological at that point because they're they're super smart individuals. You're telling them what they need to do. Like how in when you're saying like don't procrastinate and don't be afraid, these are things that I feel like you've gotten over that hump of it. But obviously, and I'm curious as to like how if you were to like look inwards, um, do you know what actually pushed you to like have that sense of urgency? Because I've met and and I don't know why that is. Um, it's it's a little bit more foreign to me. But I've met plenty of technical founders where they've you know they've built what they personally felt as the pain point um, through their domain expertise, but then like going out and taking it to market, learning the right way to sell or, or to, I guess, like even explain or pitch it to different types of uh, personas um, because obviously the end user is different than the decision maker a lot of times. And so you have to be able to explain it differently. Um, how, ha how have you personally tackled that? Because I, I, it's something that I've, yet to unlock and in terms of like convincing and i don't know what that is necessarily like you can lead them to the water but like they won't they pretty won't good drink. pretty good psychological question i think um you know what one of the things that that definitely played a big part was was the first startup mm. because that one didn't really there we didn't really make sales that that was a b2c one and so i i was fairly certain you know okay if we're going b2b then we need to sell asap and also it helps that I'm, I'm kind of a proponent of the, of the MVP theory, 
or lean startup theory, which is, you know, get it, get something to market fast and then try, try selling it and getting feedback from the market. I think that, you know, the, the sense of urgency just came from knowing that at least in my experience, okay. So in the first one, we just didn't make sales. So now if we want to have some chance of succeeding with the second one, then we actually need to close sales. Yeah. And so it's just, I, I guess it's like you just bought into that idea where I guess it's the, the philosophy of the lean startup, right? Taking some, an MVP to market and then getting that feedback loop as soon as possible, right? And it also helps that, that my co-founder, who is also a phenomenal technical guy, he's, he's the CTO. So he's actually in, in charge of all the tech stuff. He actually was very serious about, you know, okay, we should do sales. We need to make sure that this is this is acceptable to the market and that we're building the right thing. So I think we were, it helped that we were both on the same page here. Got it. Got it. That makes sense. Um, that's helpful. I think that's helpful to have like a co-founder again, like even if you're not both the best at it, pushing each other, knowing that that's an important aspect of what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Um, and so then I guess, you know, going from that second startup to now, uh, sorry, from that first startup to now with OmniSearch, um, can you walk us through, you know, like how did you, I guess, pick up from, you know, having to shut down this for this first company, you know, how, and, and obviously that's a, it's a big, uh, it's a, it's a big thing to overcome. I think like from like an, a personal perspective, it's definitely like a, a hit on your ego to a certain degree. Um, and obviously, I don't think like having a great, a big ego is, 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 is going to be helpful in any situation in, in these things, but um, it's still like hurtful to, you know, it, it breaks your heart because it's like you're, it's almost like you're building something. It's like your baby and, you know, and, and, and ultimately you have to let it go. And, and, and then you go and you make this decision to, to have another baby, right? It's like, so um, when, what was like some of the signs that pushed you into doing this second one? Uh, how quickly did you get into the second one? What gave you the conviction or the validation or, you know, any kind of, I guess, like uh, mark, su suggestion of market fit for you that gave you confidence to pursue this? Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, for first and foremost, there is, there's always with me, you know, been, been a certain conviction. I'll, I'll make it happen with something. With, with some idea. I don't know what the idea is going to be, but I'm pretty sure that if I, if I just keep on grinding, I'll, I'll get to something that's good. Mm. Um, and so I think that the, the, the main trigger was, uh, so in terms of, you know, deciding to, to not focus on the old, old one anymore and to, to basically shut it, kind of shut it down. It still, it still exists, but it's not very actively developed or maintained. Um, but it was just that, you know, the team and I, we, we played all the tricks that, that we thought we had up our sleeves and nothing really seemed to work. And so at that point, it was just like, it was heartbreaking because, you know, I had to give some layoffs um, for people that I really loved and enjoyed working with. And it obviously wasn't their fault. It's always the founder's fault. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there, there was nothing, I, I couldn't blame anyone except, except really myself for doing an idea that wasn't particularly lucrative. Um, I, so, but so on the flip side of that, I was pretty convinced that, you know, like we said, I've got a safety net, a reasonably good safety net. I'll try three different ideas if I have mm -hmm. to, and something's got, something's gonna make it. Um, and so I think that, you know, my co-founder Mate um, and I had at that point, started brainstorming about a couple of different ideas. And we had some different ideas in security and monitoring and, and such things. And this, this video search idea was one that we found pretty compelling because it was, we not only felt that we could actually nail down customer personas for that, not only the ed tech companies, but also, you know, media, even, even like e-commerce or something. Um, and apart from this, we also felt that it would be a fun thing to work on and that we could differentiate ourselves through technical excellence. Mm -hmm. And so with this, with all these things, it's obviously still a stab in the dark, but this gave us sufficient conviction that we could just 
bring it to market fairly quickly, start talking to customers, start bringing it to market, um, you know, talking directly to them and iterating on the product to converge to something that the market's going to want. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, and so with so the, your co-founder on this one, how did you guys meet or is that somebody that you were working with on the first one as well? No, we weren't working on the first one. So actually he, uh, so we were both involved in programming competitions in Croatia. And so okay. I'm, I'm a couple of years ahead of him. And so I was giving this advanced algorithms course in my old high school where he was one of the students. And so we, we've been friends for, you know, I don't know, 12 years or something like that. And so, you know, he was, uh, he was looking for a, for a bigger challenge and was kind of ready to, to, you know, take on a CTO role. And so we decided to team up and try this together. Got it. Very cool. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start wrapping up around here. Uh, we're about a little over thirty minutes already. But my next questions are just kind of, you know, you, you're still relatively young, right? In terms of the company itself, it's, it's less than two years old. Um, you know, have you have you do you feel like you guys have found market fit yet? I think so. I think yeah. so. Okay. The, the, we're, we can still, we can still do better. We can always do better and we, we can start expanding into other verticals, but I would say, yes, we've found it at this point. Cool. So I, I'm fairly confident that, that if we just keep on applying the, the same playbook, both by doubling down on the verticals that we're currently in primarily education, and then also expanding to a, a couple of the other ones and doing it little by little, but we can, you know, fulfill our, our mission of basically every major site in the world using OmniSearch mm. to, to power their search experience. Got it. Um, how large is the team now? The team is now seven people. Okay, cool. Um, and where do you imagine OmniSearch here in the next five years? IPO. <laughs> no, yeah. so uh, uh, that that's always a nice aspirational goal. Um, but I I want us. I, I'm not even thinking in terms of you know revenue or or any of these kind of pompous uh, tech press metrics or whatnot. Um, I want to build an amazing an amazing team, an amazing technical team, especially that's able to take on the, the hardest tech problems in the world, and uh, but actually in a practical way so that somebody actually pays for that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're, I, I think we're going in a pretty good direction in that sense. So I yeah. would say if you want something a bit more tactical, then it's expanding to, you know, the next five verticals and becoming really established in those. Very cool. Um, on that note, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it was really great to kind of get your story and, and hear about your technical background and also kind of how you overcame, I think some of like the personal challenges of, building a company and then learning the different skill sets that you needed to. Um, it was definitely enlightening for me to kind of understand a little bit more about the psychology of a technical founder. So I was super excited about that. Um, but yeah, nothing but the best of, of, of luck and success on OmniSearch. Can't wait to see where you guys end up in the next few years here. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, th thanks so much for having me. I hope your, uh, your listeners like it and uh, keep up the great work. I really love the interviews. Awesome. Thank you.